Hello all, welcome to this video on Networking Lab. Today I'll be talking about how to configure DNS and web server in Cisco Packet Tracer. Let us begin by looking into what a DNS is. DNS or Domain Name System is a naming database in which internet domain names are located and translated into IP addresses. The Domain Name System maps the name people use to locate a website to the IP address that a computer uses to locate that website. Web browsing and most other internet activities rely on DNS to quickly provide the information necessary to connect users to remote host. DNS mapping is distributed throughout the internet in a hierarchy of authority. Access providers and enterprises, as well as governments, universities and other organizations, typically have their own assigned range of IP addresses and an assigned domain name. They also typically run DNS servers to manage the mapping of those names to those addresses. Most URLs are built around the domain name of the web server that takes the client request. Now let us look into the history of DNS. In the 1970s, all the host names and their corresponding numerical addresses were contained in a single file called hosts.txt and were maintained by Elizabeth Feindler from the Stanford Research Institute. This was known as the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network or ARPANET directory and Feindler manually assigned the numerical addresses to domain names. By the 1980s, the system became too inefficient to maintain. In 1983, the domain name system was created to distribute what was initially one centralized file with every address in it across multiple servers and locations. In 1986, IETF listed DNS as one of the original internet standards. The organization published two documents, RFC 1034 and 1035, that described the DNS protocol and outlined the types of data it was able to carry. Now let us look into the DNS structure. The domain name is usually contained in a URL. The domain name is made up of multiple parts called labels. The domain hierarchy is read from right to left with each section denoting a subdivision. The TLD appears after the period in the domain name. Examples of top level domains or TLD include .com, .org and .edu but there are many others. Some may denote a country code or geographic location. Each label on the left-hand side of the TLD denotes another subdomain of the domain to the right. For example, in the URL www.google.com, Google is a subdomain of .com and www is a subdomain of google.com. There can be up to 127 levels of subdomains. Now let us see how a DNS server resolves a DNS query. In a typical DNS query without any caching, there are four servers that work together to deliver an IP address to the client. Recursive resolvers, root name servers, TLD name servers and authoritative name servers. The DNS recursor, also known as the DNS resolver, is a server that receives the query from the DNS client and then interact with other DNS servers to hunt down the correct IP. Once the resolver receives the request from the client, the resolver then actually behaves as a client itself, querying the other three types of DNS servers in search of the right IP. First, the resolver queries the root name server. The root server is the first step in translating human-readable domain names into IP addresses. The root server then responds to the resolver with the address of a top-level domain DNS server that stores the information for its domains. Next, the resolver queries the TLD server. The TLD server responds with the IP address of domain's authoritative name server. The recursor then queries the authoritative name server, which will respond with the IP address of the origin server. The resolver will finally pass the origin server IP address back to the client. Now, using the IP address, the client can then initiate a query directly to the origin server and the origin server will respond by sending website data that can be interpreted and displayed by the web server. Now let us look into DNS caching. 
In addition to the process that was explained before, a recursive resolver can also resolve DNS queries using cache data. After retrieving the correct IP address for a given website, the resolver will then store the information in its cache for a limited amount of time. During this time period, if any other clients send requests for the domain name, the resolver can skip the typical DNS lookup process and simply respond to the client with the IP address saved in the cache. Once the caching time limit expires, the resolver must retrieve the IP address again, creating a new entry in the cache. This time limit, referred to as the time to live or TTL, is set explicitly in the DNS records for each site. Typically, a TTL is in the 24 to 48 hour range. A TTL is necessary because web servers occasionally change their IP addresses, so resolvers cannot serve the same IP from the cache indefinitely. Now let us look into the common DNS records. A DNS record is information a query seeks depending upon the query, client or application which will require different information. First type is called A record. This stands for address and holds the IP address of a domain. These records only apply to IPv4 addresses. Most websites have only one A record but some larger sites have several which helps with load balancing by serving different A records to different users in heavy traffic. Next is NS record. This is a name server record that denote which authoritative server is responsible for having all the information about a given domain. Often domains have both primary and backup name servers to increase their reliability and multiple name server records are used to direct queries to them. Next is a TXT record, which enable administrators to enter text into DNS. The original purpose was to put human readable nodes in DNS, but today machine readable nodes are often put there. TXT records are used to confirm domain ownership, secure email, and counter email spam. Next we have CNAME record. Canonical name records are used instead of A record when there is an alias. They are used to retry the query of the same IP address with two different domains. An example would be in the URL searchsecurity.abc.com where the canonical name would query or C name would query abc.com. Next, we will look into the different types of DNS queries. The first one is a recursive DNS query. This takes place between a recursive server and the client. The answer provided is either the full name resolution or an error message saying that the name cannot be found. Recursive queries end in either the answer or an error. Next is an iterative DNS query. This takes place between the recursive resolver, which is a local DNS server, and the non-local name server like the root, TLD or authoritative name server. Iterative queries do not demand a name resolution. The name server may instead respond with a referral. The root server refers the recursive server to the TLD which refers it to the authoritative server. The authoritative server provides the domain name to the recursive server if it has it. Iterative queries resolve in either an answer or a referral. Next we have non-recursive queries. These are those for which the recursive resolver already knows where to get the answer. Answer is either cached on the recursive server or the recursive server knows to skip the root and TLD servers and go directly to a specific authoritative server. It is non-recursive because there is no need and therefore no request for any more queries. Non-recursive queries resolve in the answer. If a recursive resolver has cached an IP address from a previous session and serves that address upon the next request, this is considered as a non-recursive query. Next we look into the second part where we have to also set up a web server which will resolve the HTTP request. Now let us look into the details for a web server. 
A web server is a software and hardware that uses HTTP, which is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and other protocols to respond to client requests made over the World Wide Web. The main job of a web server is to display website content through storing, processing, and delivering web pages to users. Besides HTTP, web servers also support SMTP, which is Symbol Mail Transfer Protocol, and FTP, file transfer protocols used for email file transfer, and storage. Let us look into the working of a web server. Web server software is accessed through the domain names of websites and ensures the delivery of the site's content to the requesting user. The software side is also comprised of several components with at least an HTTP server. The HTTP server is able to understand HTTP and URLs. As hardware, a web server is a computer that stores the web server, software, and other files related to the website, such as the HTML documents, images, and JavaScript files. When a web browser like a Google Chrome or Firefox needs a file that's hosted on a web server, the browser will request the file by HTTP. When the request is received by the web server, the HTTP server will accept the request, find the content and send it back to the browser through HTTP. More specifically, when a browser requests a page from a web server, the process will follow a series of steps. First, a person will specify a URL in the web browser's address bar. The web browser will then obtain the IP address of the domain name, either translating the URL through DNS or by searching in its cache. This will bring the browser to a web server. The browser will then request the specific file from the web server by an HTTP request. The web server will respond, sending the browser the requested page again through HTTP. If the requested page does not exist or if something goes wrong, the web server will respond with an error message. The browser will then be able to display the web page. Multiple domains can also be hosted on one web server. Now let us look into some of the uses of a web server. Now web servers can be used for sending and receiving emails, downloading requests for FTP files and building and publishing of web pages. Now let us see what a dynamic and static web server is. A web server can be used to serve either as static or dynamic content. Static refers to the content being shown as is, while dynamic content can be updated and changed. A static web server will consist of a computer and HTTP software. It is considered static because the server will send hosted files as is to a browser. Dynamic web browsers will consist of a web server and other software such as an application server and database. It is considered dynamic because the application server can be used to update any hosted files before they are sent to a browser. The web server can generate content when it is requested from the database. Though this process is more flexible, it is also more complicated. Now let us see a sample network which we will be implementing in this example. So here we have three PCs and two servers. This will be the DNS server with the IP address 10.10.10.1 and this is the HTTP server with the address 10.10.10.2 and the three PCs with the addresses 10.3, 10.4 and 10.5. So after setting the IP address for DNS server, we'll go to its DNS service and enter the required changes as in we'll enter the entry for which the corresponding IP address will be accessed in a browser. And in HTTP server also, we'll enable the HTTP services. There we'll be editing the already existing HTML page and making it as per our requirement. Now let's move on to see the demo. In the demo here, we will be using three PCs. 
as we have seen in the sample discussed in the presentation before. So we have the three PCs and we will take a switch and we need two servers. One is the DNS server and the other is the HTTP server. And we will take place in the connections. So with this option, the type of connection will be automatically updated or you can do it as per the requirement. Now next we will go to the DNS server, go to the IP configuration, its IP address 10.10.10.1 and its DNS server will be the same 10.10.10.1. Then we go to the services, click on DNS, make it on and enter the website www.abc.com and the corresponding address which will be the address of the HTTP server 10.10.10.2. After that it is added as an entry. Now coming into the HTTP server, we will go to the IP address which is 10.10.10.2. There also the DNS server will be 10.10.10.1. There since it is an HTTP server, we need to enable the HTTP service. It's already on. We are modifying the index.html file. And here we are giving a config text inside it and modifying the Cisco packet tracer as packet tracer. Now we need to save it. So this will overwrite the existing file. Then we'll go to each PC and set its IP address. 10.10.10.3 DNS IP will be 10.10.10.1 Similar is the case for other two PCs and the second PC will have the IP address 10.10.10.4 and the DNS 10.1 and the third PC with the IP address as 10.10.10.5 and the IP address 10.10.10.1 sorry the DNS server address 10.10.10.1 now we are trying to send message from the server to PC so since that process was successful we can confirm that the connection exists there now coming into the web browser of any of the PCs you can take in we have to check whether when we access the particular website address we are able to get it or not www.abc.com we got the modified page now going into another PC I am trying to enter the IP address of that site and seeing whether I can access the same data to see if the mapping was done properly or not 10.10.10.2 you can see that same page has appeared that's all for now thank you for watching